So God gives faith to believe to those who ask. God gives faith to believe to those who ask. So let's look at Mark chapter number 9, please. And we'll begin reading in verse number 14. <clears throat> and when he came to his disciples, so uh, when he came to his disciples is Jesus. When Jesus came to his disciples, Jesus saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway or immediately all the people when they beheld Jesus were greatly amazed and running to him saluted Jesus. And he asked the scribes, what question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, he foameth, gnashes with his teeth, pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast them out, and they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him to him, and when he saw him, straightway or immediately the spirit tear him, fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes it has cast him into fire, into waters, to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. <clears throat> and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, Come out of him and enter no more into him. The spirit cried and rent him sore, came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, said, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee. He would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask. Let's pray. Father, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, our hearts turned to you asking that you would give ears to hear and eyes to see this morning to someone whose heart has yet to be opened by the gospel. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that the unconverted person, he or she who's not yet been born again, would come to faith in Christ today. That their life would be changed by the power of the gospel and that we could be through your word, a blessing to all who are in need of hearing from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's get started. <clears throat> While Jesus, Peter, James, and John are out the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus transfigured himself before them, nine disciples were left on the ground and they were ministering to others. Three are up in the mountain. Nine are left behind. Four or five days between going up, staying up there, and coming back. That's enough time for the disciples to be on the ground ministering to others. The scenario is that they come down off the mountain in the triangle here. Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Nine disciples in the blue circle. Scribes are there questioning him. And a crowd has assembled around the disciples. When Jesus saw his disciples, saw the great multitude, he arrives on the scene and really he's going to take pressure off of the disciples because they're having to answer questions right now that they can't answer. They don't know why they weren't able to kick this demon out of this man. They don't understand why they were not able to do it. They have already done this before. 
Chapter 6 and 7 and 8, they've done this before. At one time, they had the faith to kick out demons. This scenario, they're not able to do it, and they don't have any answers. So Jesus intervenes and says, what are you questioning him about? What, what's this conversation going on over here? Is Jesus asking because he doesn't know the answer? No, no of course not. That's ludicrous to suggest such a thing. So obviously this is a way of redirecting, getting the attention off the disciples. Jesus said, I'll take over from here, so to speak. One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I've brought unto thee my son. He has a dumb spirit. Whithersoever he taketh him, he tears, foams, gnashes with his teeth, pines away. What a rough description. I mean, this dad is overwhelmed with his son. This is unbelievable what he's going through right here. So number one, we see the problem. And the problem is epilepsy. The problem is some kind of sickness. There's a demon possession going on. There's a physical handicap here. The boy is mute. There's self-destructive behavior going on. I mean, really, in this little situation, just about all of life's problems are wrapped up here. I mean, we're dealing with true spiritual warfare. We've got a physical handicap going on. This boy might be sick or some kind of disease. And this dad is slap dab, wore out. No other way around it. He's went to the nine disciples for help, and they could do nothing. So he's now at a last resort. Nothing left to do at this point. Master, turn to you, Lord. The disciples tried. They couldn't. Let's try another one. So I want to say, before we blame God for this, and oh, are we tempted to do that. We are all in this room tempted to blame God. There isn't any one of us that hasn't had that thought go through our minds at least once. Before, before we charge God with unrighteousness, before we reach out to God with anger, before we strike out to God in our frustration, before we conclude that it's His fault, let's remember that all of this is a direct or indirect consequence of the fall of man. Moreover, let me stop my foot right now here. Moreover, let us remember that that free will that we love so dearly, that we talk about, that choice that we endear so much, the fact that we're human beings who can make a decision, we can choose one way or the other, that that very thing, free will, contributed to this problem. That which I love so much, the fact that I can say, choose you this day, make a decision, see for yourself, all those kind of things that make me a free will being, and I am, to some degree, to some degree, God's still in control, God's still in charge, so whatever free will I have, it's the free will that he permits me to have. And in this situation, that very free will has contributed to this entire situation right here. Epileptic, foaming at the mouth, demon possession, all that. Could God have kept the demons from uh, rebelling and falling from grace? Could God have done that? Yes. Sure he could have. Could God have taken away the choice in, for Adam and Eve? Of course he could have. Sure he could have. But the fact of the matter is he gave it to them and now we're here. Now we're here dealing with all this. I spoke to the disciples and they could cast them out. They could not. We've already been down this road. We've already tried this. So problem number two is that prayer has not worked. Prayer has not worked. Now am I by myself or have you been there and you're there and you're struggling where prayer has not worked? Am I the only one this morning or have you been in a situation where you said, I prayed about that. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about that. I mean, I've prayed, I've prayed. It's not that I haven't prayed, I have. I mean, I've done there, I've been there, I've been on my knees, I've been praying, 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 praying. This man is at its wit's end. He, he, he can't believe it. I went to nine of your disciples. You mean to tell me that nine disciples could muster enough power together to do this? But there's a greater problem. Look at verse 19 in your text to see the greater problem. The problem's not just isolated with this situation. There's a greater problem in this scenario. Look at verse number 19. 
see the greater problem. And he answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation. We're no longer dealing with just this man now. That's not where the problem is. It's not just this man. Jesus makes an assessment to the generation, to the scribes, to the disciples, to all 12 of them, to the man, to the boy, to the multitude, to everyone there. And he says, oh, faithless generation, you need to understand something. God is not okay with his people being faithless. He is not okay with that. God is not okay with people being idolaters. He is not okay with you picking and choosing when you'll serve him. He is not okay with you deciding how much you'll worship him. He is not okay with that. Don't think for a moment that he's a big God and doesn't really care whether I worship him or not. Acts 17.30 commands all men everywhere to repent. All cultures, all peoples, all languages, all idolaters, including me. He is not okay with us being faithless. There is, in fact, let us remember, greater condemnation to this group. Mark 6, 11. We already preached it, but let's look back on our screen. Whatsoever you shall receive you, referring to the disciples, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust from under your feet for a testimony against them. A testimony. Then he says, notice very clearly, truly I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than judgment for this city. There are degrees of accountability. There are greater degrees and lesser degrees of accountability. And every single Sunday, we assemble and we hear prayer, we hear praise, we see God work. We are, in fact, more accountable. Your accountability is ratcheting up every single time you come for a collective assembly. More and more and more and more and more and more. It is not neutral. All people are not accountable equally. All are accountable, but not all are accountable equally. Make sure you understand that. You and I, because of where we've been positioned, just like this group in the previous slide. Art, let's go back, please. <clears throat> One more, please. Oh, faithless, look at it right there in green, generation. Those that are alive at the time of Christ, those who heard the Messiah speak, those who saw the miracles take place, have a greater degree of accountability. Likewise, in the 21st century, all of us who have a Bible in our language, you understand that that sets you apart. You understand that there are still thousands of languages on the planet that do not have a Bible in their language. So if you are an English-speaking adult, just ratchet up your own accountability. Just ratchet it up. Just, just ratchet it up. If you've ever heard a gospel presentation, ratchet it up. If you've heard two or three, ratchet it up. If you go to a private school, take it on up a few more notches. What are you saying, preacher? Hey, this is what I'm saying. Let's just be clear this morning. Since most people are absent, we don't have very many visitors. It's a good time to be clear. It's going to be a really, really, really hot hell. Hot, hot, and hotter. Hotness. Degrees of accountability. He said it'll be more tolerable for you. It'll be more tolerable for, for Sodom and Gomorrah. Now remember, that's the city that God wiped off the planet. No LGBT movement or agenda in that city. Nope. Gone. ACLU eliminated. Just wiped off. Okay? Not moving forward with your agenda here. Okay, I'll take care of your AIDS problem. Gone. Are you, are you not compassionate? You better believe I'm compassionate toward those that are, are byproducts of that illness. Don't misunderstand what I was saying there. 
Don't misunderstand for a moment that we're not being compassionate towards those who are temporarily inflicted or permanently inflicted because of no consequence of their own. We're just as compassionate as somebody who's driving down the road sober and gets hit by a drunk driver. Innocent bystander. Same idea. So now, what is our responsibility? What I want to tell you, according to the text, our responsibility is always tied to exercising faith. We are always called to exercise faith. We are always called to exercise faith. And the only people that are exempt from this are those who cannot exercise faith. Only those, only ones. You, who are you talking to? Well, in Jonah 4.11, you remember this story. Let's just remind ourselves briefly. This was that racist prophet who didn't want to see those people repent and be spared. That's what he was. That's who he was. He was a racist. And he got an attitude when God spared the city. A significant attitude. And this is what God's response was. Hey, Jonah. Hey, 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 knucklehead. Have you forgotten that there are 120,000 souls in that city who don't even know the left from the right? These people can't exercise faith. They can't repent. They don't even know their left from their right. They're, they're not at an age or a moment of accountability. Pastor Bill and I talked about this this week. Maybe you could check in and listen to this uh, audio recording which we had this discussion about this age of accountability or a moment of accountability. There are human beings that just simply cannot exercise faith. The mental capacity is not there, but for anyone who can, you're accountable. You're accountable. If you have the ability to exercise faith, if you understand the idea of trust, confidence, belief, and all that, if God's gifted you with the cognitive thinking skills to understand what that is, you are on the hook. Accountable before God. So let's look at verse 20. They brought him unto him, and when he saw him, Straightway the spirit tear him, fell on the ground, wallowing and foaming. You almost get this idea that the demon knows who this is that he's standing before. <clears throat> and this is one de- last ditch of rebellion, one last thrashing moment, one last internal, I'm still in charge of this being right here. And the demon shakes the boy and he's flying around. And have you ever seen an epileptic seizure before? I have. Isn't it a scary thing to watch an epileptic seizure and you feel so helpless? There's a person who's just so out of control. That's this boy. First we serve a description. Then the boy comes in the presence. And at the moment in which the demon recognizes he is in the presence of the Christ... He takes over and there's this jolting and foaming and gnashing and and it's just unbelievable the way Mark describes all the details so we understand how serious this problem is. And Jesus said, for the crowd's benefit, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And And the father says, of a child. Maybe he's a teenager, maybe he's 12, 13 years old, something like that, because he's making a reference to as of a child, so he must be old enough to distinguish between the two. As of a child, and oftentimes has cast him into fire and into waters to destroy him. Imagine being the parent of this child. Every time you go to the lake, every time you go to a pond, every time there's a creek somewhere, you've got to watch your boy because this demon is making a beeline with your child to the creek, to the river, to the pond to get the kid drowned. Isn't that what it says? Hey, is this dad tired of parenting? He's struggling. This dad is wore out. This dad is prayed and prayed and looked for this and deliverance and deliverance and deliverance and deliverance and and he hadn't found it yet. He just has not found it yet. Imagine having to protect your child against fire. Every time there's a fire, open flame, anytime there's a flame, he's always going for the flame, always going for the flame. And you're running to grab your child and, and their child is thrashing with you. That's what's being described right here. And the text reminds us, because dads here are stepping up, that dads have a responsibility to care for, lead, guys, shepherd the hearts, and provide for the needs of their children. We don't know where the mother is, but dad's stepping up and do what dad's called to do. And I'm here to tell you, I'm just going to stop right now and remind you that dads are called to be dads. You are not called to be addicted to those stupid video games. 
hey, it's time to grow up. Put away those childish things. When I was a boy, I played with video games. I'm an adult now. I don't play with video games. Get going, grow up! I'm just here to tell you. I'm just calling it the way I see it. Okay, it's time to be a man. Step up, marry, raise a family, do the right thing. We don't need any more 30-year-olds addicted to video games in society. We don't. We don't. What do we need you doing? Being a dad, being a husband, going to work, providing for society, setting the example, grabbing your boy and saying, let's go, I'm taking you to the doctor. You got far too moms. You don't have to beat up on mom. Mom does it. Mom just does an instinct. Mom just does it. It's very, 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 very rare that you hear about mom abandoning it. It's just the opposite with guys. So here I am to remind you, do your job. Follow this man's example. Grab your boy. Take him to the doctor. Take your doctor to the Lord. Take, him, take your boy to the Lord. Deliver him to the master. Point him to Jesus. Right? It's not your Sunday school teacher's job to show him how to be saved. It's not the preacher's job. You open up the gospel and show him that he's a sinner separated from a holy and righteous God. And outside of divine grace, he will spend eternity in hell. You do it. You don't, don't, don't worry about your, oh, that's why I got him in Christian school. That's why, that's why we put him in Christian school, so we don't have to worry about it. I pay you $4,000 a year and you want me to be the spiritual leader? Are you kidding? What do you think I pay you for? So dad says, and dad's wore out. We're not here to judge dad. Dad says, but if thou canst. Say, why is he saying that? He's already been to nine disciples. He's already been to nine disciples and they couldn't do it. So he's wore out. He's not sure anybody can do it. He's not sure if there's any hope. If there's any deliverance at all. And so dad says, but if thou canst. See the doubt? Do anything. If you can do anything. Can you mitigate this in some way, form or fashion? Can you lessen it to some degree? Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if thou canst. The ESV says, got an explanation mark right here. The and, and, uh, New King James says, if thou can, if you can, if you can. It seems to be a play on word occurring here. <laughs> you just said to me, if thou can. And Jesus says, if you can. Oh, oh if you can. The issue is not with me. Right. That's not where the issue is. He says, you believe. Right. So number four, God requires faith. God requires faith. You must exercise faith. You must exercise faith. You must exercise faith. You must exercise personal, individual faith. Indiv you. Faith is belief in that which has no tangible proof. Beginning with the reality of God. That's where we start. There is a God who sent his son, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. We believe this by faith. So I want to do a stop right here. Pause. Time out. We are not teaching possibility thinking. We're not thinking the power of good thoughts. We're not thinking, if you can dream it, you can do it. That's not what this verse is teaching us today. This is not my opportunity to write another book and put it on the stack of all the other millions of books that have been written and rip off more Christians. Norman Vincent Peale started this power of positive thinking. Now, let me just stop here. We don't need to be negative. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We don't need a church to be full of a bunch of whining, I can't be done. I don't mean that. That's a ditch on that side. But the ditch on the other side is this ability, if, if you can dream it, you can do it. Hey, brother, I've dreamt about flying plenty, but I can't fly. Okay? You dream about jumping out of that aircraft without a parachute. Go ahead, jump. Just make sure you got your life insurance paid up well. Put the church down there as one of the beneficiaries. My point is, my point is we cannot jerk this scripture. If thou canst, thou can do all things. We can't jerk it out of context. We can't write a whole book about it. 
We have to be educated. We have to be aware of the fact that there are people out there that take advantage of the Word of God, twist it, and market books off of that, which is not what the Scripture says. Most of us that are 40 years older or more can remember the Robert Schuller and the Crystal Cathedral and that whole hour of power. Nearly many of us can remember that. Place is bankrupt. So much for possibility thinking. Shutting down. So let's look at verse 23 then. Look in your Bible then. What is this all, all? What is this all about? Because the Bible says all. So we need to stop right now and talk about this. Let's look at together in our Bible. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. All things are possible. So all's all? Well, wait a minute. There are things that are not possible. What do you mean there are things that are not possible? It's not possible for God to lie. So we can't just go all's all. There has to be some governing limiting to this. All is used within the context of communicating the power of God to hear and answer prayer. So let's put some, some limits to this. Let's, let's wrap something around this word all. How about this one? John 14, 13, 14. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I've had church members say, that means that if I say in Jesus' name, he'll do it. No. That's not what that means. That's not what that means. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, so all I got to do is whip out that Jesus name. It's like a credit card. No. No, that's not what that means at all. So then what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? It means get your prayers in line with the will of God. You line up with him. He doesn't line up with you. You move to him in your prayer life. You start praying about what God would have you to pray about and stop praying about that which God would not have you to pray about. So let's answer some questions. How does God answering this prayer bring glory to his name? So for all you sports nuts out there, stop praying that your team's going to win the final four and go the distance. God doesn't give a rip. You want to argue about it? Let's spend some time arguing about this. Send me some Bible verses. Love to have an email exchange with you. Stop praying that, oh, I pray you makes that catch. That makes a mockery of prayer. Man, I really pray that, that, that hey, he's on a free flow line. Stop. Stop. That's not what prayer is. Prayer's not an intercom from your den to get Doritos delivered while you're watching the game. It's not what prayer is. Prayer is a serious petition to God for that which is legitimate. Question number two. Is this a legitimate need? Stop praying that God will bless you with the Mercedes Benz. If you want a Mercedes Benz, you just start saving your money, work really hard. When you got enough saved, go buy yourself a Mercedes Benz and be done with it. And then do not put a sticker on that that says blessed. Put a sticker that says worked hard. Why are you saying that, preacher? Because God is not a cosmic bellhop that delivers Mercedes-Benz to those who want them. And what that implies is, if you're not driving a Mercedes-Benz, you're not blessed. And that's not the implication that we want people to draw. All of us can manage our money any way we want. If it's very important for you to do that, then save and work real hard and get a second job. Go into debt. Whatever you need to do, get that. But don't waste your... I didn't say that about going to debt. It's not a good thing. Thank you, Arlene. I was being sarcastic. <laughs> My point is, God is not a cosmic bellhop that delivers Mercedes to those that do it. If you've got a legitimate need, pray about it. Jeff Price needs a job. That's a legitimate need. Is he supposed to work... 
Yes. Supposed to take care of his family? Yes. Do they need food to eat? Yes. Do you need shelter? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And by the way, while we're here for just a moment, let's talk about this constant praying about healing. If we're praying for God's healing, there needs to be a reason behind it. And that's because when we get off the bed, we're going to go back to glorifying God. You get all that good healing just to go back to your sinful lifestyle. What a mockery of that is. Number three. The word with was changed also, but it didn't make the cut. Let's read it. If this request, is this request clearly within the revealed should be will of the Lord. Right there. The revealed will of the Lord. All right. What are you saying, preacher? Stop. Listen, please. If you don't know that it's within the revealed will of the Lord, then pray for the will of the Lord to be. Look, look. Some things are clearly within the revealed will of the Lord. So you can pray very specifically for those things. If it's not within the revealed will of the Lord, then how should we pray? Pray that the Lord's will be done. See the difference? That's praying in Jesus' name. If your prayer time sounds more like a letter to Santa Claus... Fix your prayer time. Fix your prayer time. Pray about that which truly brings glory to the Lord. So here's one. Here's one right here. Look at it. Lord, I believe. Help thou in my unbelief. Now let's not jump over this. We've got plenty of time. We're on spring break. Plenty of time. Let's not jump over this. We've got a God who requires faith. Right? Did we say that? And then he's so awesome that you can pray for faith and he gives it to you. Don't miss this. You can be at the point where you don't even know how to pray. And you know that you don't have enough pray to pray to prayer. I mean, you, you literally, I don't even have enough prayer to get words out of my mouth. I mean, I know how uh, weary I am. I know how uh, chewed up I am. I know how exasperated I am. I know how wore out I am. I know how wearied I am. I know that I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And God, obviously, you're not going to answer. So really what I need right now, God, is some faith to keep praying. Here, Sean, take some. It's called grace. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. Turn over to James chapter number 4, please. James 4, to talk about this praying. James 4. When you get there, get out a pen and mark this scripture. This is a good Bible verse for you to commit to memory. Know where it's at. Underline it. James 4, please. <clears throat> James chapter number 4 Hebrews and then James and right before 1st and 2nd Peter so let's look at the Bible I'll put it on the screen for those that don't have their Bible with them this morning from where comes wars and fightings among you where do the conflicts come from? Where do the battles come from? Where do the internal conflicts come from? Where do the family battles, nation battles, clan battles, tribes, where do they all come from? They come from the lust that war in our members. You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have. You cannot have. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. Whoa, oh, all you got to do is ask. Can't stop there. Got to keep reading. Can't pull verses out of context. So let's read verse 3. You ask and receive not. Why? Why do I ask and receive not? Look at it very clearly. Because you ask amiss that you may consume it 
upon your own lusts. There it is right there. You're asking wrongly. Your motivation is all chewed up. Your motivation is purely selfish. This now becomes the grid by which I filter prayer through. This is the grid. This is the grid right here. I've got a filter right here. When you filter wa water through a filter, it cleans out the impurities. Here's my grid right here. I'm going to turn that into a filter right there. Is this prayer request something that I want to consume? Now, I just want you to think about the fact like this. Think about above this auditorium is a gigantic filter. Just a massive um, uh, carbon filter like we do water through. And every prayer request that is for personal, selfish, consuming, just never, it just never makes it through the filter. It just never makes it through the filter. It, it doesn't, it just, you, God knows this is a selfish prayer. This is a prayer for a uh, two-door BMW red convertible, right? That Michelin tires, leather interior, in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, brother, for helping me on that. I needed to throw that in, in the beginning and in the end. And really what we got, if you look in the ceiling, think about the, the uh, ceiling tiles up here. Think of that as a, just a big filter. And I look up and it says, James 4.3. Oh, man, James 4.3. James 4.3. Selfish. You just want to consume it. It doesn't have any real value to the kingdom of God. It doesn't contribute to the globalization of the gospel message. It doesn't contribute to personal faith or doesn't contribute to real needs. It's not a legitimate thing. Turn back to Matthew 7 for another parallel kind of an idea. Matthew 7, please. Let's hear the words of our Lord. Matthew 7, 7. <clears throat> Verse 7 says, ask, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, there's been an amazing number of books that have been written just on that single verse right there. As though God is a Santa Claus in the sky. And you can just, bop, 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 just constantly going off. And man, he just exists to just be dispensing stuff to you, man. Almost like an Amazon.com uh, shipping warehouse in which everything's organized and systematized. And uh, his angels are FedEx and UPS just shipping you stuff all the time. But let's keep reading. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and him that knocks shall be opened. Or what is a man if there is you whom his son asks him bread, will he give him a stone? If he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how much to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So I don't want to do anything to discourage you from praying. Because you've got it right there. That is an incredible encouragement to pray. That your heavenly father loves you, that he cares about you. And if you think that an earthly father would ever give a, a bread, a stone to a son who asked for bread, this is your heavenly father. So I want to tell you right now, we need to be a praying people. I, I, I want to I balance it is what I'm trying to say here. Over in this ditch, I'm not praying at all because I'm, I'm not sure it's within God's will. And over in this ditch, I'm just bombarding God's throne with every possible thing in the world as though he's Santa Claus. And we don't want to live in either ditch, church. That's what I'm trying to say to you. We do want to be a praying people. We do want to ask and seek and knock and find and all those things. So well, we've got a lesson here. Those who are struggling with not having enough faith to believe should ask God for more faith. Consider the difference between asking God to save you from your sins and asking God to give you faith to believe in Him. So what are you saying here, preacher? Sometimes you're going to be doing personal soul winning with somebody, Bob. And they say, I don't believe. And what you can tell them is, ask God to give you faith to believe. 
Now think how good that is. Because they're saying, they're saying, man, Doug, they're saying, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I have enough faith to believe what you Christians believe. And that's a legitimate statement, isn't it? Isn't that a fair, legitimate, honest statement? I, I, I can work with that. You believe there's a God. I don't even believe there's a God. You believe that God sent His Son. I'm not sure He did. You believe that God forgives sins. I'm not sure He does. Those are all legitimate things. You can understand where somebody could say that. It takes faith to believe in the gospel. So what then can you offer to them? What then can you reach out to them? I would say to them, start asking for faith. Do you have enough faith to start asking for faith? Ask God to reveal himself to you. Ask God to open your eyes. Ask God to open your ears. Ask God to open your heart. Ask God, ask God, ask God. Don't just leave him at the idea of, oh, you don't have enough faith, I'm sorry, enjoy hell. No, not at all. Ask them. Have you ever thought about asking God for faith? I didn't know we could ask God for faith. Yeah, you sure can. There's this guy in Mark chapter number 9, and he said, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. And God gave him faith to believe, and he healed the man. That could be you. So when Jesus saw the people came running together, rebuked the fowl, saying, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried out, rent the man, sore came out of him, and he was much as was dead. Look at it. And so much that many said, he's dead. That's exactly the way God wanted it to be. Get out. The demon says, I'll leave this guy looking like he's dead. But Jesus, look at this now. Don't miss this. This is very intentional. Took him by the hand. Picked him up. Jesus was not going to let, let them think that the man's dead. He's going to make sure that everyone understands the mission accomplished. Healing took place. You're going to date yourself if you remember this song, but we, this was a, just an oldie but a great one. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me. Remember that? It's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful song. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. So let's just pause right now and ask you, has he touched you? Has the master ever touched you? Has he ever grabbed a hold of you? Do you remember when you were shackled by a heavy burden? Do you remember when you were like Pilgrim in Pilgrim's Progress? overwhelmed with your sin and knew that your sin had separated you from a holy and righteous God? Could you sing this song this morning? If we were to drum it up, would you be able to say, shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Could that be your testimony this morning? Would you nod your head or do some type of something to give me an indication that you could relate to that? Oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. You can be sure, you can be sure that dad and that boy went home singing glory hallelujah he touched me oh the joy that fills my soul so let's end with a hard question is my lack of faith the reason God has not answered my prayer Now, church, this is not the time to dismiss me because we've got to be so careful here. So please listen. Please. You just think, if you walk up to somebody and you say to them, the reason God hasn't answered your prayer is because you don't have enough faith 
you might as well take a dump truck and dump it on top of them. Because you don't know that. You don't know that. So don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. There are people who have an enormous amount of faith and all they're getting is wait. And you don't have any right to walk up to them and dump onto them a truckload of guilt. Because if you tell somebody the reason God hasn't answered your prayer is because you don't have enough faith. You have just saddled them with the personal responsibility of that entire thing. And you don't have the right to do that. You're not God. You don't know why God is or isn't healing in this particular situation. Are you following me this morning? We want to encourage everyone to have more faith. We want to encourage people to pray for faith and realize that faith can be delivered. But to suggest to someone that the reason you're in the mess you're in is because you just don't have enough faith is such a self-righteous, condemning thing that we would never, ever, ever want to communicate those words. That would bring to their lives such overwhelming personal guilt as though if they could just somehow muster more faith, this would be solved. So I want to conclude with Paul. Basically, we've got three scenarios. Scenario number one is sometimes you pray and God answers right away. Aren't those awesome? When that happens, isn't that great? When you pray about something, God comes through. And you just go, man, that was awesome. And you just say, then there are other times when you pray and nope. And the scripture actually speaks to that this kind of comes out by more prayer and fasting. Those are times when you're going to have to be incredibly persistent. You're going to need to put more faith in God. You're going to need to fast. You're going to need to kick the door open. You're really going to need to be persistent. And then there's a third time, a third category. And in that third category, you're not getting your prayer answered. And that is the answer. You're right, brother. But you're not getting an answer the way you want it answered. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, Paul talks about this amazing time in which I went to heaven. Whether in the body or out of body, I don't know. Me or someone else, I believe it was clearly him. And then notice what he says. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Here's your thorn in the flesh, Paul. Deal with this. Notice what it says. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. A messenger of Satan. You've got a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. God is sovereignly using this messenger of Satan to inflict on your life grief. Do you see that with me? Why? Paul says, well, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart me. Paul says, I went three separate occasions and said, God, you've got to do this, something about this. You've got, you got to do something about this. God, you've got to answer this prayer. Now, who in this room has got the nerve to tell Paul he didn't have enough faith? <laughs> Had Paul seen God do amazing things? Yes. So we're not dealing with lack of faith. That can't be the issue. Paul gets bit by a viper, throws it off. Paul lays hands, people rise from the grave, dead. And we're dealing with an amazing man. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ should rest upon me. And let me just tell you right now, folks, I'm not there. That's where we want to be. That's where we want to move to. That's where we want to get when God says, no, no, deal with it. No. Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Paul said, 
I learned that God knows best. And I learned that if I were not to have this thorn in my flesh, I would be out of control because of the abundant revelations which I've seen and others haven't. So God intentionally buffets me with this messenger of Satan to keep me in check. Therefore, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. I take pleasure in reproaches. I take pleasure in necessities. I take pleasure in persecutions. I take pleasure in distress. What an amazing perspective to get to. Not easy. Agree? But that's sanctification right there. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So this is what we know to be true as we wrap it up right now. Sometimes you can ask for faith and God will give you faith. Sometimes you can ask for faith and God will give you grace. Did you get the difference there? There's only a fine line of difference there because they're both gifts from God. Sometimes you ask for faith and you get the faith. Sometimes you ask for faith and God says, here's some grace. Deal with it. Let's pray.